Good evening, everyone and welcome to Old South Meeting House. My name is Erica Lindemood. I'm the Education Director here at the Meeting House. We are pleased that you've joined us this evening to learn about the history of the Boston Floating Hospital. And now I'm very pleased to introduce Daniel Bird, a driving force behind the recently published history of the Boston Floating Hospital. I have uh, been at the Floating Hospital for Children and Tufts Medical Center for about 23 years. I started as a volunteer and now I'm the volunteer director and one of the things that the volunteer department does, we get involved with m most of the departments of the hospital. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the hospital, by the way, is, is, is the floating hospital. For, when I say the hospital, it's Tufts Medical Center. It's the floating hospital for children. It's also an adult hospital that, whose origins were the uh, Boston Dispensary. <clears throat> It's also the primary teaching hospital for Tufts University Medical School, and it's one of the largest research uh, teaching hospitals in the country. So it's a large organization, a large institution, the floating hospital being a part of it, and we'll kind of talk about how they all got together. And one of the things that volunteers do is we get involved with most of the departments of the hospital, and because we get involved with most of the departments of the hospital, I, probably more than most people at the uh, uh, hospital, know my way around. I get involved with what's going on. I know where everything is. And so as a result, I've become the, the, the unofficial tour guide for Tufts Medical Center, which is also part of the floating. <coughs> And I'm also, because of my love of history, um, I'm the unofficial historian of the Floating Hospital for Children in the Tufts Medical Center. <clears throat> and, and in that capacity, I, well, I'll be giving tours, whether it's just, you know, small children's school groups, uh, to doctors or visiting dignitaries or uh, maybe new employees. One of the first questions that's asked invariably is, why do they call it the Floating Hospital for Children? What an odd name for a children's hospital. And so I say, well, because it started as a boat, which instantly comes, why would you put children out on a boat? Uh, it's just, you know, like it seems like we're getting rid of them and putting them out on a boat. What do you do with them when they're out on the boat, you know? Um, and I said, well, it's it, depending on the, the group and depending on the time, I said, it's a great and interesting story that I'd like to tell you a little bit about. And that's what I'd like to do today is tell you a little bit about the story of the children that went out on, on the boat. The, the, you can't imagine a boat today. It wouldn't make sense today. But if you went back into Boston back in um, uh, back in 18, the 1890s, you'd be able to understand maybe a little bit about why they created what they did. Boston back in the 1890s, as many cities in, in, in the United States, was being uh, 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 populated by immigrants, and there were waves and waves of immigrants were coming into the city, and they were from, they were poor, they were uneducated, they were just basically escaping an old world, and they were sort of shoved into a relatively small city, which Boston is, and they were living in tenements, they were living in the South End, they're living in uh, conditions that were really not very healthy, to be quite honest with you. Uh, <clears throat> but there, but they were there, and uh, their conditions were one thing. Uh, but those conditions didn't help the health of those individuals because they, there wasn't good housekeeping, there was no sanitation, there was no electricity. Um, so the health care for uh, in those days was very, very, very poor. If you had money back in those days, uh, you could have a doctor who would come to your house or wherever you lived, and he could give you whatever medical care was available at the time. And back in those days, uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty rudimentary. They really didn't didn't have much idea of what the causes were of most of the illnesses, and they had even less idea of what the cures would be. What most doctors did and most medical was basically take care of the symptoms and made you maybe feel a little bit better, so you hopefully would survive whatever illness or disease you had, and they would, and if you lived, then, then that, was the, that was the success of, of the program. But as much as, as, as poor or as little as the health care was for adults, it was non-existent for children. I mean, it didn't exist. Uh, children basically were was ignored, and it's hard for us to believe because we are a society now that really caters to children. Uh, and in those days, children just like if they got sick, they got sick, and if they died, they died. And I, I, it's like I, I still can't get over that. Back in those days, uh, one in ten children died before the age of five. It was sort of the fact of life. That's sort of how it was, and maybe that's why they had such large families in those days because. They would, they would die. Um, 
And so it was, it was, it was something that, that, because they took it for granted, nobody really was paying attention to the children's uh, illnesses. And any work that they did with children, they basically considered them little adults. Uh, in a sense of, a, if, uh, I'll, I'll took an analogy, which isn't really true in those days. If you had a pill for an adult, they'd break it in half and give it to a, a child. And they say, that's, that's, that's children's uh, health care. Uh, it, it just didn't exist. Um, in those days, uh, there was maybe a half dozen doctors nationwide throughout the whole country that specialized in, in, in children's health care. Six in the United States. I mean, just, it was totally ignored. Um, <clears throat> so, so, that we have to, so I'm trying to do is paint a picture of, of how this whole thing came about because the children, they were just, and then also the children had their own individual diseases that, that adults didn't have. They had whooping cough, diphtheria, dysentery, uh, something called cholera and phantom, which was really strong during the summer. And because adults didn't get it, the adults didn't worry about it. And if the kids got it, the kids got it. So it's, it's, I guess it's a mindset that I'm trying to impart upon you that, that where this whole thing started. But the mothers, of course, loved their children and they would do anything they could to make them better. Uh, and there was, at the time, the only thing they thought would make them better or feel a little better was fresh air and, and healthy food. And healthy food was almost impossible to come by because there was no refrigeration and food was spoiled and very often that was the cause of many of the children's diseases was the, uh, was the spoiled milk or the spoiled food that they would just eat anyways and the kids would get sick and, and, and the story would be told. Um, but one of the things, to get, it was the fresh air. So very often uh, mothers, and I use the mothers, I'm sure there were many fathers that did this also, but this, it's for the, this purposes. The mothers would take their children, and Boston was lucky because we actually had an ocean, and we had pretty much fresh air, if you will. So the mothers would take their babies and their small children down to the beaches, down to the to the piers and the, uh, along the Boston uh, waterfront, <clears throat> and walk back and forth trying to get some some fresh air for the babies and for the children. And it, in many ways it was. If you think about it, if you're in a tenement, you're in the third, fourth floor, and it's 90 degrees, um, and the air was stifling, coming out to, to the fresh air in the city would be uh, quite a, a dramatic improvement for the children. Well, this is where Reverend Toby comes in. Um, Reverend Toby was a, uh, obviously he was a reverend, but he was a, uh, the pastor of the Berkeley Street uh, Temple, and he was also uh, involved with many social uh, organizations of the time. If you, ha if you have to go back in those days, the governments didn't look at, at, at there was no such thing as a safety net. Uh, the governments just didn't get involved in, in working with, the, with families and that. It was considered something that private people, charities would get involved in. So there were many, many charities, many do-good, do-gooders, if you will, and I don't mean that negatively, people who wanted to help out, and that was sort of the culture of, of, the, of the time. And he was involved with many of these organizations. One of them was uh, called Lend a Hand, uh, uh, and it was uh, called the 10 Times 10 uh, Society, 10 Times 1 Society, which I won't get into what the details of that was, except Edward Everett Hale, who wrote The Man Without a Country, was leading one of them. Anyways, to bring Reverend Toby into the picture, one day, uh, or evening I should say, on the way home, uh, walking across the Dover Street Bridge or towards the Broadway station to take a train back to, to Wallison in the evening, he and his associate, Lewis Freeman, um, going across the bridge, and, this, uh, and he noticed all the mothers walking back, pacing back and forth with their children, and realizing that, that these children were more than just hot, they were sick. And nobody could actually, and that was the best thing he was doing. He thought it was disgraceful. He said, this is unbelievable that we're, we're doing what, we're doing so little for these children and not helping the mothers at all. Quote, we should do something about that. And that's the, that's the story of how most good things happen in life, is the idea, you know, we should do something about that. But he was the right person to say we should do something about that because he went back to the various organizations that he was a, a part of and associated with and said, you know, we, we really should do something about that. We, we can't let these children and go, we can't let them be that sick. We have to have to somehow come up with it. Don't, don't. The organizations he belonged to were responsive to that. They started raising money, they, but they didn't know what to do with this. How do we actually solve the problem? <clears throat> they heard, somebody had heard that there was a ship in New York Harbor that was a, uh, a, a hospital, I think it was for adults. It didn't last very long. It, it didn't, wasn't quite like it wasn't very successful. But it was a germ of an idea of, of, of a ship out in the, uh, New York 
Yakov that was treating people for, for, as, a, as a hospital ship. They said, well, well, wait a minute. Why, rather than doing it with adults, why don't we take, take a, get a ship, go into Boston Harbor, and put the children on, on a boat where they can get an incredible amount of fresh air uh, uh, all day uh, during the voyage. And, and this was the, the thing is, while they're there, why don't we have doctors and nurses see these children? Bingo. There was, the, there was the idea, the germ of the idea. Well, once that idea was put out into the community, the community rallied. Uh, Boston uh, um, had a lot of wealthy people, had a lot of people who really wanted to. Uh, they were civically minded. They, 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 they got the money together, they got an idea, and, but as much as they had, they didn't have enough money to build a boat, and they didn't have enough money to even buy a boat. So what they did was they actually rented a boat. And it wasn't really even a boat, it was a barge. <coughs> And the, the, the barge was um, something called the Clifford. And the Clifford was what we call today a, 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 a excursion ship. It was for entertainment. Uh, am I echoing? I, I seem to be for me, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the, the, it was where people go out for dining and dancing in the evening, so it was, a, it was an entertainment would leave and go out at night into Boston Harbor. It was towed by a tug going out into it. And I mean, they do that today, actually they don't have tugs doing it, but it was a very common thing to do uh, way back when, and it was back in the 1890s. But you think about it, that ship went out in the evening and around midnight it would come back to whatever dock it had and it wasn't being used all day long. So uh, Reverend Toby made arrangements with the owners of the Clifford to actually turn it during the daytime into a ship, a, a hospital ship. It was like, like you can see a whole idea coming together here. And they, so at midnight, that first night on January 23rd, uh, 1894, uh, they just took this, this, the Clifford and they brought it to uh, the pier. They stripped it of all the things that were in entertainment, the, the, the dance floor, the, the restaurant, the tables and chairs and, and the music and whatnot. And they, by, by nine o'clock the next morning, they had turned it into a hospital ship. Beds, uh, medical supplies, things that we would need to put a, 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 a for a, a rudimentary anyways, a hospital ship. At nine o'clock that next morning, the first group of, of, of mothers and their babies came up, came to the dock and went out on the ship. And it was, um, it was, I don't know, was, the city of Boston took its, it took it to its heart, the, the, the idea of the floating. There were publicity, there was crowds of people at the dock just watching the ship take off the first time. The media, which I, I love to say the media because all there was in the media in those days was newspapers. But they had multiple newspapers in those days, no radio, TV and all that. It was, it was the, one of the biggest events of that entire summer was this floating ship going out with the, where they call it a baby's outing. And so it had a lot of publicity and it was very, very successful. That first, that first voyage went out yeah, the children came back with uh, a diagnosis of what was wrong with them, some medical uh, advice on how to take care of, of the issues that they had, and it was met with such success that more money came in and, and they were able to go back out a second day about a week, two weeks later. Well, that first year they actually went out six times out of the Boston Harbor and, and started uh, uh, what became a Boston institution. Everybody wanted to be part of the floating hospital for children. The second year they raised more money and they went back out. By the third year, they actually bought the Clifford, uh, and, and it was became, you know, it became, an, as I say, an institution. But what it also started to develop was a national reputation, because Boston was finally doing something for the sick children. Other cities, they either wanted to, but they didn't have a vehicle for doing it. And everybody says, oh my God, Boston's actually figured out something that actually works. They so were actually finding ways to take these sick children and help them. You know, the mortality rate actually, even on the boat, I have to say this as, as much, the mortality rate was almost a third, if you believe it. By the time these children got out into the boat, they were so sick that about a third of them didn't even survive. So, I mean, it just shows you how desperate the, the situation was for that. Around 1905, uh, the Clifford was just so crowded, and we'll, I have some pictures I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, the Clifford was just so crowded uh, <coughs> that they, they, they just had to get uh, another a boat, a bigger boat, and they again raised it. Money was a big issue. You know, you just don't, uh, the doctors and the nurses were volunteers. They were, they were quote, free. But if you putting a boat out, you have the crew, you have uh, food, you have uh, laundry, you have, uh, you have to rent the boat. So it was a lot of money involved. So it wasn't, wasn't just a very simple thing. But by uh, 19 
1906, they actually built the ship that you, that you see up there right now. Uh, it was built over in, over in East Boston at the Atlantic Works. And this was the first ship ever built in the world, if you will, uh, to be a hospital ship. It's the first ship that was ever designed from the ground up, if you will, to be what it is uh, was meant to be, which is a hospital ship. And we'll show some more pictures of it a little bit later. Well, that ship uh, was, it was specially designed. It was quite wider than, than, than a, a normal ship would be, so it would be more stable, so it was out on Boston Harbor, wouldn't, wouldn't rock so much. Um, it had uh, room for 200 uh, children out there. And um, although I don't know what I mentioned to it, but when they went out, the mothers went with them. And because you think about it, if you had 200 babies and small children, you needed the mothers. You, you were not about to send out 200 kids into, into a boat. So the mothers were involved and uh, were out since the very, very first, first ship. And this, which is a story all by itself, because in those days, uh, they used to keep the parents away, as far away as they possibly could from uh, health care, from the, from the babies and the children. Mothers were considered to be in the way. They were counterproductive. They would, you know, the doctor would be wanting to do something, and the mother say, oh, no, that's not what my child really needs. So there was basically, if they could keep the parents and the mothers in particular away from the children, that was the, that was the course. Uh, uh, they just, they, you have to remember doctors in those days, and, and I don't say so much today, but they were pretty much an elite group that didn't like to be countermanded. They didn't like anybody to suggest that they may be wrong or maybe an alternate way of doing something. Um, so this was a, a, a huge thing, getting the mothers out there. Well, it turns out that mothers were a really great idea uh, being out there because the mothers were able to communicate as to why the child may have gotten sick in the first place. It may have, uh, the mothers were able to communicate with the child, uh, that mothers were able to continue the care after the child left the boat. The, the child would go home at the end of the night, but if the mothers didn't know what to do and how to take care of them, what good was that, that one day out on the ship? So they started to educate the mothers on how maybe the child got sick in the first place, so maybe the siblings wouldn't get sick. Um, but also how to care for the child afterwards. They, all of a sudden, they started to embrace the mothers. And the mothers became an integral part of what the floating hospital was. It was a, it was a total break in how people were uh, uh, treated, uh, families were treated. They actually wanted the families to be part of the process. We take that as a, as a, as a no-brainer at this point, that if you go to the floating hospital today, you're gonna find an extra bed just for parents. You're gonna find parents there all the time. We, just, we take it as the normal course of events. So the flo floating hospital, um, what was going on out on the boat is the parents were there. Um, what, they, what they did also from the very, very beginning was that they started to do research into how the children get sick in the first place. And they started to realize that if you have 100 or 200 children and babies, they, you had maybe 30 or 40 that had whooping cough. You had 30 or 40 that, that call and fan. They started really, there was patterns of who got sick, how they got sick, what, you know, and then also started, they started doing some, some, some uh, cures that say, well, when we did this with these, this group of children, it worked, we did it with that, it didn't, they, rather than cheating one child and another child here and there, because they had so many all in one place, they're actually able to do some real research into the causes and, and, the, and the cures of ch childhood diseases. So right from the very beginning, research was a major portion of what made the floating hospital uh, special uh, out there. Um, what I'd like to do is, so anyways, the, the, that boat went out there for uh, 27 more years. Uh, excuse me, for uh, 21 more years. And it wasn't until 1927, uh, uh, when about to start the new season, that that ship was at a pier at, uh, out in uh, the North End, and the pier caught fire, and the fire went to the boat, and the boat burned to the ground. Uh, and there was nobody on the boat, nobody got hurt, uh, but the boat was gone. And uh, when they, 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 this, this choice at that point was, do we need a bigger and better boat for, to, for, the, for the children? And they realized by that time, they realized it was the fresh air wasn't really the most important part of the, the process for the cure, that they, they could actually have a, a hospital, a children's hospital on dry land. And they did, and through the insurance money for the boat and the gen generosity from the brothers called Jackson, they built the Jackson building over an ash street right next to the Boston dispensary. And that existed for almost 50 years. And then eventually in 1983, uh, they went to the building that's there now today over on Washington Street, uh, the, what we call now the new Boston Floating Hospital for Children. What I'd like to do is, is that was sort of like an overview, if you will, how the whole thing is started. There's a, there's a, there's a series of photos uh, that a lot of them are, are in the book. Uh, it was just, we were just very lucky to, that we were able to save as many as we could. But I'd like to show you some of the photos and kind of flesh out
about the, the story that we have here. I'll kind of kind of go through these and kind of talk a little bit about it. But I, the, the, it was a big, again, as I said in the beginning, you have to go back to why the floating came about. You have to go back to what what Boston was like. So if you can picture, that was pretty much a State Street in downtown Boston. You can see the State House. The old, if you picture, that's the environment that the that the uh, that the the, the uh, Boston floating was created. That's an oil painting of the Dover Bridge. That's where the mothers were walking back and forth where Reverend Toby uh, saw the, the, the mothers and wanted to actually do something about it. The reason why they even painted that was because it, that bridge at the time was a great tourist, if you will. People would look back into the city of Boston and the way it was positioned. Right now it's just part of, a, part of the big dig practically. This is Reverend Toby himself. It's kind of an unusual photo of him because he very rarely had a beard, but it's the only photo that we actually have of him like that, holding a young baby. He stayed with the hospital. Hospital over over 20 years as the head of uh, the, the the floating hospital foundation, and he was great at fundraising, great at publicity, great at getting more and more people to be aware of what the floating was and what it could be. Um, this is the picture of the Clifford uh, being towed in Boston Harbor, uh, and you can see it was it was it was literally just a barge. Uh, I want to say one more. That's a, a better picture. You can see they had the even with floating because when they finally bought it, they were actually able to put the name of it. But what I really wanted to show you was uh, I guess it's a, a point. Well, you can see it. How crowded it was! It was absolutely just mobbed with with, with uh, patients and and uh, mothers and and crew members and, and doctors and nurses uh, and siblings. That was another thing I wanted to mention was that that they, they actually allowed other brothers and sisters to go with the mother um, because if the mother had to take care of the child at home, she wouldn't be able to take the sick one with them. So they actually allowed a sibling to come aboard. Well, that. that this whole thing was so revolutionary because because it was on a boat, they had to keep breaking all these rules. These nobody ever do it, but because it was a boat, they said, "Well, it's a boat. I guess we have to do it this way." So what they did with the children, the siblings, they actually created a kindergarten, and the kindergarten was actually had a kindergarten on the boat. And that idea of treating children as children who happened to have an illness or disease, again, was a, was a, was a change of a paradigm in how how they viewed this whole whole uh, institution. And this is an article from one of the newspapers at the time. They called it the baby's outing. The first excursion of the season in the floating hospital sailed down the harbor. Um, let me see if I have um, one of these things here. It's not going to work. That's all right. Um, they talk about that when it seemed like every time the floating went out, it was good weather. So they started calling it, it was called the floating weather uh, along the way. So uh, it, was a, it was a big publicity. Uh, everybody knew uh, what the days that they were going out, because they would go out maybe once or twice a week, but everybody knew which day it would be. And I, I included this photo because you could just see the variety of people that would be on the cliff. You have, you have crew members, you have mothers, you have doctors, you have nurses, uh, you have siblings. It must have been an interesting boat to be on uh, when you think about it. Have hundreds of killed children, hundreds of uh, caretakers. Going back, as I talked a little bit about, they were constantly looking for, for money for fundraising. By the way, the, 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 they were never charged any fees. This, any medical care was always free. Uh, they never charged, I guess, until around almost the 1930, and then it was a very nominal fee. So, and also the other thing, which is not to do with fundraising, everybody uh, was there was never any exclusion, uh, whether race, creed, religion. There was from the very get-go, everybody was welcome. As they are today. This one here is a fundraiser. Somebody actually gave $100, and Rufus Toby, the chairman and manager, manager, actually signed it. They were very creative about how they did their fundraising. One was, a, of course, a certificate. Um, but this one here was a souvenir card uh, for a cabaret and a pops concert that they had over in Hull. <coughs> and it was a sort of a, a, a little a souvenir that they would do it back in August uh, 1913 over by uh, Allerton. And that's obviously next to Boston Light. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great photo. This photo here was something that uh, a little boy looking through. This was a iconic photo. They, 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 when children would come to the floating, everybody wanted to have their picture taken inside the the, uh, the life raft there, uh, the, the floating. And it would became everybody would go like they do it today. And when you go to a amusement park, everybody wanted to. And there was more photos of the children looking out. But that particular one, maybe it's because of his eyes or whatever. And I think it's a boy. In fact, I really don't know. Um, but that one actually became uh, something that's been used even to today when they talk about the floating. It's still used in our publicity, still used in our, our marketing and that. 
the, who would think about it? If you had literally 1,000 to 2,000 children who needed medical help, how did they pick the 150, 200 that would go out there? Um, and it was, it was very often life or death. If you were able to get your child out into the boat, you had a chance that maybe your child would live. If not, there was, you were really t uh, t taking a, a, a chances. So what they did was they had a, 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 a organization called Associated Charities, and a mother would have to take the child to this, uh, this place, this organization, and it would be assessed by doctors and nurses at that facility to see whether it was appropriate to have the child go out on the boat. I mean, if the child had a broken arm, they didn't need to be out on the boat. If the child was contagious, they shouldn't be out on the boat. If the child had something that really was really, really so sick, they really was no chance of helping them. So there was a, an assessment uh, that went on there. But if the mother was successful and the ch child was able to, the mother got a ticket. Uh, they called them tickets. And it was red, brilliant, brilliant red. And on the flip side, there were all kinds of instructions to the mother of what she could do, what she couldn't do, uh, uh, had to arrive at a certain time, where to go, what time and whatnot. Uh, you see along the side of the Sanitary Race, no contagious diseases admitted. There's a date, August 4th, 7th, and that, and they would circle which one that the mother was, was supposed to go on. The, the other thing was that on the back of it, one of the rules that the mothers had was they were not allowed to bring food aboard. They believed that the food that the mother had was probably not very good food. It was probably, even if not contaminated, it was probably not healthy, if you will, uh, you, uh, to be generous. So any food that was brought to the pier to go out on the boat was actually thrown away. They didn't even want to give it to anybody else because they served food on the, on the boat and they served healthy food. Apparently it was excellent food. And sometimes they were saying some of the food that they got on the boat was the best meals these, these children ever got in their entire life. So that was the ticket. And that ticket was, was worth maybe a child's life. That's how valuable that piece of paper was. This is uh, they're going from the pier onto the ship. And it's just a typical picture. But I give you a sense of who was there, the mothers and what they looked like, the clothes that they had. But if you notice on the left, there's a little girl there. And that would be the sibling. That would be the little, little older, probably in this context, the older sister who was allowed to go on, who eventually went to the, um, the kindergarten that would be there. And this is another, you can look at the long line of people waiting to get on. Now the doctors would again be a final uh, arbiter as to who would actually be allowed on. And it reminds me of, of, of when the, in people from immigration, they'd come to a city and if they didn't pass that immigration, they had a cataract. So they had something physically wrong with them. They were told to either go back to Ireland or, or go out to a, an island someplace because they were not gonna be allowed on. Maybe they, they had a contagious disease. There were many mothers were turned away right there just before they get on the boat. And that sometimes would be the, the difference between the child's uh, life and not. Uh, again, another picture similar to, I love the, 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 the costumes are quite interesting. But I wanted to show the picture to the woman to the far left uh, with, the, with the bag. She was actually a visiting nurse. And so many, there were so many firsts on the, on the floating, but one of them was that they, they had the concept of having a visiting nurse. Because if the child went out for the day and the doctors had a prescribed a regimen of, of, of health care, the mothers go, they actually wanted nurses to go back and check up to see whether the mother was actually following through. In fact, is the child getting better? And, and to, to uh, take it to the next step. So the concept of visiting nurses, which we take for granted again now, again, is started as, as an out, outcropping of the Boston Floating Hospital. Um, we talked about the new ship being built that happened to be an oil painting that was built over in East Boston. And uh, this is a, the only photo that I have been able to find uh, of the Clifford and, and the, what in the rest of the world would call the Boston Floating Hospital ship. You can see the enormous difference um, uh, between the two. This is a moving day on August 14th, and they moved uh, every, all the medical equipment that they had that was on the cliff to, the, to the, uh, the big ship. By the way, there's a replica of the big ship, if you will, at the uh, floating hospital today on the plaza level. It was, it was done from the original drawings of it. If you ever had a chance to go there, it's just an amazing uh, 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 model of, the, of that ship. <clears throat> The ship itself, as I mentioned, it was a was an absolutely beautiful ship. You have to have to see it. It was so big in Boston Harbor. Uh, the, the, most ships were small and uh, of nearly not, not very distinctive. But if, can you imagine that being out in Boston Harbor? I guess the other ships would go out there and they would be blowing the horns and the whistles and they would make it, they'd, they'd do circles around the floating ship they, and then when they would be going out into the harbor, they would actually, um, <coughs> um, they would actually follow it. So it ended up being sometimes like a parade going out there. Um, 
the, the next thing I want to show you was, oh, by the way, this, the, I showed you there's some postcards. I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at it. It became so famous. Worldwide, I mean, nationwide, people were talking about the floating hospital. Um, and for a brief while, it was a, uh, turned into a, a dormitory for the Navy back in World War I. Uh, so it was commissioned the USS Boston Floating Hospital. Um, a day in the floating, and this is uh, uh, something I'd like to read to you. Uh, the ship is obviously out by Boston Light, and this is from Lewis Freeman, who was the person who went with Reverend Toby when it was first started. Lewis Freeman is describing a typical day's voyage in his journal. We'd go out whenever there was a breeze, we'd leave the North End Pier at nine in the morning, go out into the upper harbor, and then into the lower harbor, and down to Long Island, opposite Deer Island. If the breeze got too heavy, we'd turn around and come back into Dorchester Bay and anchor off of Thompson's Island. On Sunday, we'd go through Hull Gut and anchor off of Pemberton. Sometimes, if the air was just right, we travel up to Marble Head or go down to off the Situate Light. But our favorite spot to anchor and have lunch was just off of Boston Light. The late housekeeper would sound the foghorn in our honor and the children would wave back. So you could you could just see the impact that this ship had. People just were, were att attracted to it. It was probably one of the most famous things that was going on in Boston at the time. I use the word milk because it, was, it seemed like a funny thing to, to have. Um, but I, I said one of the first things they did was, was, was research. One of the biggest, actually the majority of the children that was sick was sick with something called cholera and phantom. And cholera and phantom was, uh, was basically caused by drinking uh, sour milk, a bad milk. And it was very often during the summer when the milk would, would, would uh, not be as healthy. And that was immediately one of the first things they had to do some research was, was how to actually replace this mother's milk. They tried to do cow's milk and goat's milk and there was too much calcium or whatever. And they were continually trying to improve the, the quality of milk. Because you picture it, you have two babies and small children out on a boat, you needed a lot of milk. Well, one of the only milk that was found that was satisfactory was mother's milk. And, and as much as that was, they tried to get as much mother's milk as they could, they didn't have enough. So they actually had something called a milk bank. And they would send nurses out into the greater Boston area. And they would go to mothers that had just recently had a baby and collect mother's milk in huge tanks and bring it back to the ship for that day's uh, voyage. So that's how much milk that they really needed. As a matter of fact, when they brought it back, they would, we have big vats of, of mother's milk they would they bring back, and this man is actually bottling mother's milk uh, to be used uh, uh, during the voyage that day. Um, the, uh, educating the mothers was a huge part of this also, and this particular one is they, uh, they are being educated how to sterilize the bottles. Uh, so much of this, it was an uneducated population, and they really didn't realize the value of, of sterilization, the value of, of quality food. Um, well, that they couldn't have enough mother's milk. No matter how much they had, they never had enough. So they kept trying to find something that would be more stable, something that they could use whenever they wanted to, rather than when they happened to have enough milk. So there's a Reverend, uh, excuse me, a doctor, um, uh, uh, Bosworth, in his laboratory, was actually able to create a compound that mirrors uh, 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 chemically uh, what mother's milk is, and it was in a powdered form, so all they would have to do was just add water, and they would have milk whenever they wanted it. Well, that formula uh, was, was Similac, what we now call Similac. Similac was actually invented out in Boston Harbor. Um, and <clears throat> Boston uh, Floating Hospital, they wanted everybody to know about this, this product, so they gave, gave it away for Free. They gave the recipe away, the, the patent away free, and uh, all over the country, people started bottling. They had another name for it. It was the Franklin Infant Food. It was the first name that they had for it. Well, a company called Abbott Chemical, which exists today, decided to patent this. We never bothered, we, the floating house, never bothered to patent this. The Abbott Chemical decided they were going to patent this, and they patented it under the, the trade name of Similac, and you can see all the various products that they have. Had the floating hospital decided to keep it and patent it itself, we wouldn't be looking for money today, we would be m much better off. Um, one of the things that, that happens to a photo of doctors and nurses with, with small children is in the old days, there was a very strict regimen of the, that the medical people were considered high, like high and mighty. And th th this idea that if you're out on a ship with hundreds of kids and, and that, you're going to end up, you can't just have this, this strict separation between the doctors and the caretakers and the children and their mothers. They started to integrate. They started breaking down some of the barriers of who was 
who could, who, you, who could you talk to? Who could you associate with? So they, 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 they regimented, they would, the doctors started taking children into their laps, and you could see the nurses with the small children. They started treating these children who were sick as, as, as children and as, as babies. And I just, there's a couple of pictures here, but I wanted to show you the, the camaraderie and, the, and the, the, the feeling that was out there in the ship at the time. The nurses that were there, they would, as I said, nobody was educated in, into what we now call pediatrics. So the, they actually created a graduate school for uh, pediatrics. So the, these are nurses uh, that had a nursing degree. They actually were given graduate degree on infants, uh, working with infants, preemies, uh, what, to, what to do and how to do it, and actually had a, had a certificate program. This was a, a, a graduating class in 1926. Uh, there were about 65 um, uh, nurses that were there uh, back in 1926. And they they were all given graduate degrees. What happened was the floating was actually an incubator for, for education and pediatrics. These girls, and later on you see a photo of, of, of the doctors, they would then go back out to the rest of the country, to St. Louis and California and all that, and they would actually, they would actually take what they learned on the floating and actually spread it around the country. Um, this is a typical inpatient unit. I love the straw hats that, that, they, that they wore and the, and the outfits that they had. Uh, we actually have one of those beds that was managed to be saved. Uh, but that was a typical unit. Um, if we went to the floating hospital today, you'd see this uh, a unit with basically one child per unit and all these electronic pieces of equipment and all that. And that's pretty much uh, a different story. Look at the crowd of people that is up there. And to the left, you see a grandmother and a, and a grandchild. Doctors, patients, uh, crew members, uh, nurses and whatever, look at the children on the floor there. So it must have been a, quite an amazing uh, a place to be. Uh, and there's a picture with a couple of the little baby girl, and this is a picture of some of the doctors that were there back in 1912. And there they were, uh, this, we have another book coming out, and that's going to be the cover photo of, uh, of treating a small child. Uh, uh, <clears throat> The picture here is of the Boston uh, dispensary, and this, the, the, the relationship of, of the floating, most of the doctors that were there on the floating, uh, some of them came from Harvard Medical, but most of them came from Boston dispensary. Boston dispensary was the third oldest hospital uh, medical set, uh, facility in the country, uh, and it's over on Bennett Street and Ash Street, and the, the doctors there were the ones that were actually became the doctors for the floating. So the relationship between the, uh, the, the dispensary and the floating has been since its very existence, and today that's actually what makes up Tufts Medical Center. The, the, the uh, Boston Dispensary, uh, which eventually turned into a, uh, the Tufts Medical Center, the Floating House for Children, Tufts Medical School, and uh, the Pratt Diagnostic all grouped together into what became known as New England Medical Center. And New England Medical Center eventually morphed into what we now call Tufts, Tufts uh, Medical Center. In kindergarten, fire drills, and what is it? Uh, air conditioning and visitors. Um, this is a photo of the of the uh, uh, the air the um, uh, the kindergarten that was there. This is Mrs. Parker, and these are some of the children, the siblings that were out there on that. That idea of, of working with the children. We now have something called the child life area, in which the children who are in the hospital. We have a play area, but it's a beautiful play area, and and uh, something that was unique at the time, and now is very very common. Uh, this is a, a picture of the of the uh, meeting the food uh, there was a, some of the most delicious food apparently that was available to them um, I, I talked a little bit about air conditioning it's, it's even though they're out in Boston Harbor sometimes and you know we lived the past couple of days it was 90 degrees around here how hot it was even if you're out in the harbor it was really too hot um, there was a candy factory in, in Milton that if you think about it, the candy factory in the middle of the summer the candy's got to melt they actually put air conditioning in this this candy factory out in Milton and and somebody who was a doctor on the, uh, on the ship was, went to get some candy and said, why, this place is really cool in the middle of, middle of the summer, how did you do it? And said, so, well, we have air conditioning. They actually took the concept of it and they put air conditioning out on the ship. It was the first, and I've heard of this, whether it's true or not, I don't know, it was the first ship in the world that was ever air conditioned, was the Boston Floating Hospital for Children, because they really, you know, there's no point in having these children out there to get fresh air if it was too hot for them to, to, to be there. Um, I love this photo. Uh, these were these were uh, children who were, uh, obviously had rickets and they were trying to get the, the vitamin D from the sunshine, and so they were sending them up to the top deck and wish them well. So I think it's a great little photograph. Uh, I wonder where those kids are today. Um, one of the things is the visitors. Um, 
this is a, you get a free cup of coffee. People wanted to be associated with the, fel the floating hospital. So they had dignitaries, the doctors from around the country. They had uh, politicians. Uh, they also had people who, who were most prized. And these are people who would con contribute money to the floating. And if they were really good, they got a free lunch. Uh, the thing started in 1894. And this was even one year later, they were already giving away uh, free lunches. So it, as it was going on, the floating, as successful as it was, it just couldn't do everything for the children that it really, really wanted to do. So they started to create what's known, as you can see in the left, an onshore department. This is on Wigglesworth Street out by uh, Longwood Avenue, uh, is now. And the floating was only there during the summer. And so with the ch children were sick in the winter, or the children needed longer care, they, they could be, ha be handled in, in a day, they would very often take them to this onshore department. The onshore department also had uh, facilities for longer care, but they had more research facilities. I keep bringing back research because it was a major part of what made the floating special. It, was, it wasn't just a place to care for the children. It was a place to figure out what was wrong with them and how, and how to uh, care for them even more uh, effectively. This happened to be another picture of, 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 of Reverend Toby, a very rare one. But he's taking a shuttle car from the boat, which you see up there, out to Wigglesworth Street. And the, the child is in the, the nurse's arms there has a whooping cough. And so they were taking it to the, to the onshore department. It's happened to be an oil painting. Uh, uh, and I, the reason why I, I included it is that the pier that you see there is the pier that caught on fire. And the, that's where the, the ship was, and that's where the, the, um, uh, the fire caught and the, and the, and the boat burnt. When, it, when the, the on land sh uh, floating hospital was created, this was the Jackson building. And you can see up in the far, up in the right hand corner, the top floor, was an open area, a play area. And they, even, they, even though it wasn't on a boat, they still carried forth the idea of having a play area for the children. And, uh, so place for, the, for them to be. And I really like this little photo here, a little boy looking up. Uh, by the way, that sign that says the Boston Floating Hospital and the cornucopia up above still exists up in Maine, and we try to make arrangements to have it brought back to Boston. A small personal story uh, which grosses people out when I tell it, but I was a patient at this building right here. When I was a baby, uh, cigarettes used to be wrapped in cellophane packages, and I managed as a baby to stuff the cellophane up my nose and it went up into my sinuses and is a gross, uh, sorry. So they had to take a big force up and go up and pull it out. I, I guess I smelled really badly. The, the cellophane started to rot. And uh, so it was more than just a diaper. It was, it was the cellophane that was up there. And to this day, I still get bloody noses, but that's my only connection before I became the director of volunteers. Um, the floating hospital today, I, I want to you know, wind down if I, if I can, but it's a modern medical institution. It, it, it has people from all over the world come to the floating. Uh, one of the more famous groups of people was when they had the Chernobyl uh, meltdown of the uh, reactor. Uh, the children that were there, uh, uh, not all of them, but the majority of them, were invited to come to Boston uh, for further treatment. And they were treated at the floating hospital for children. And, and actually, they were put up in, in uh, people's homes around. And they still come today, even though they're not even little children anymore. Um, but the floating hospital will, will have people from around the world to come to, to be there. Oh, that's the replica that I wanted to talk about. It's an absolutely amazing replica. But it gives you a better sense of the, of the whole ship. That person who made this, he actually has, it, in the motors of the drove the ship was actually in that, that replica that, that's there. Um, and this is a photo of it off in the distance. And uh, it'll hold, uh, it's, it's could, one of the things with the floating, it has sort of a, a, a second child syndrome. The Children's Hospital in Boston is considered one of the best hospitals in the entire world. So if you picture yourself being the other hospital in Boston, you've got the best hospital in the entire world as your neighbor. And so no matter how good you are, no matter how big you are, no matter what you're doing, it's really great and wonderful, you'll always be the second child, if you will. So we could either have a, have a, a, a an attitude about that, or we could say that that's going to make us try harder, like the old Avis, we're, we're number two, so we try harder. So in many ways, and I'm not trying to be a commercial for the floating, is that we are many more, many more, more innovative. We have to be a little more creative about how we approach things and as we were from the very beginning the concept of well we could do it the way we've always done it all why don't we try something new and different and the, that has been a tradition since the beginning and it continues to this day and, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very proud to be part of it uh, that's a skipper uh, that's if you anybody recognizes that used to be the F.E.O. Schwartz bear over in Boylston Street when they went bankrupt uh, they had a contest of where would the uh, bear go and the children's hospital wanted the children's museum wanted it we wanted it and a couple of others so 
we actually won the children in Chinatown, which is where the hospital is, won the contest to have the bear. And then they had a second contest of what to name the bear. And seeing as how it's a floating hospital for children, they named the bear a skipper, which I think is a, a and you can't quite see it, but this is the favorite spot for, for little kids to take photos. So on any given day, even in the snow and whatnot, they'll have three or four children be climbing up and they'll be taking their, their picture with, with, with Skipper. And that's the story that I have. Uh, so I, I, I thank you very much for, for, for being here. Uh, I'm very proud to be part of it. Um, uh, this is the book is is just a very short story about the book. It was given to me as a manuscript about two years ago that couldn't get published, and they said do what you want with it. And uh, so uh, my role, I'm not the author, but I'm, I'm sort of the person that sort of got it got it uh, got it published. And so I'm very proud of the book. But if you have any interest in learning more about the floating, I'd like to see more photos that we have in there. This is in the in the book, and I I give tours of the hospital. So if someone wants to call me, I have, my, if you have that blue sheet there, my name's in the back of it, the contact. Uh, I give tours to groups and individuals if you'd like to go to the floating or to the, the whole hospital, we'd be more than glad to do that. Uh, it would be a great honor to, to, to take any one of you or all of you together. Uh, I'd be glad to do that. I'm wondering how, when Children's Hospital was founded and then how it relates to floating. I really don't know. <laughs> How's that for an honest answer? Uh, except they tend to have more inpatient, the floating hospital. It tends to have about 400 inpatients, uh, and not as much on the clinical side, uh, outpatient. We, the floating, tend to have more outpatient and more research associated with our care. Uh, although we have an inpatient division, it's not the dominant. We're more into how the child gets sick, what we can do to, to cure it. So we, there's more of a research side to the floating than, than maybe the children's. The children came on the boat, but then they had to get off initially, then they had to get off the boat because it was used as something else. Right. So could they get on the next day? You said something about they just went out six times like in the first they went out, and the, each, each day they had a different group of children. Oh, so it was every day. So it was every day or that, you know, the six times that first year and then they went out about 12 times mostly, almost like every other week, but it'll be a different group of children each day. Oh, okay, thank you. And, yeah, so it was, it was quite a, quite a, a turnover and if they needed follow-up kids, yeah, that's where these visiting nurses would come in. And also, what's the street that, you know, the little boy looking at the... Um, that's Ash Street. Ash? Ash it's a kind of Bennett, uh, which is, is, if you know Boston, is, uh, where Washington is, Stewart and, and Neyland Street. One street up is where Bennett Street used to intersect with Washington. So that's where, that's where Ash Street is. It's, it's just a small thing is where the, the elevated, the orange line used to come up and become an elevated right, right at, that, at that very spot. We some just, Things like that. Did uh, Floating Hospital work with the um, Instructive District Nursing Association? That's the precursor to the visiting nurses. Was was that the group that you yes. were referring to? Yes, it was. It was it was a float and uh, that they it was it was almost because they weren't getting paid. It was sort of an ad hoc. Uh, arrangement that eventually institutionalized and yes it became part of that that organization uh, and it's now worldwide actually that uh, the visiting nurses association yeah so so that picture with the nurse yes so so was that the instructive district nursing association there was was that that nurse I don't know. I don't know specifically if that was or not. Uh, I just know that, that that what she represented was what turned into the, the uh, like an official organization. There was more uh, nurses that were on the ship that wanted to would then also start visiting the, pe the, the patients at home. So I, it wasn't really a, a, a direct from one to the other. There, there was, they weren't the, the organization didn't exist at that time. It, it evolved. Which organization are, are, are you talking about? Just the, the, the International the, the vis Visiting Nurses Association. Oh, because they started in 1893 or something like that? As, as an organization. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because they worked with the Boston Dispensary. Right. And, and that dispensary and the floating hospital worked together in terms of, of, of what, the, what the nurses were doing in terms of whether they were working with adults or were working with children. And so that when they were with the children, that was a, a whole new area for the, the nurses to, to, to become part of. So. Okay. Can I tell you, I ask you a quick question? Does anybody here know why the orange line is the orange line? They call it the orange line? 
why the orange line is called the orange. This is not a joke. Called the orange line. <laughs> Street. That's right. Uh, and why yeah. was it called Orange Street? <laughs> it, was, it was named Orange Street Is because it? when we were a colony, the, the building reminded me that when we were a colony, one of our kings was William of Orange. Uh -huh. And so they named the street after our king, if you will. And then when we became uh, a country with a president, we named it Washington Street. So the subway goes right underneath Orange Street, if you will. And the red line is the red line because it used to end in Harvard Square. And the blue line because it goes under the ocean in the green line because it goes out to the Fenways and that's enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very, very much. Right, thank Appreciate you all. It. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Perhaps there is something to be gained by first-hand knowledge of one of the Earth's truly bad places. <laughs> Some wisdom and exposure to the dark heart of power. Unfortunately, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs>